All right, young scholars, this is uh, picking up where we left off. We're on page 10 of the PDF. Um, I've annotated this one, and I'm going to upload this as a copy that you can um, use instead of the one you have because I've made <coughs> some alterations to it. Okay, um, so anyway, we um, have them traveling along. Uh, let's see, I highlighted here in the pocket of his knapsack, he'd found, okay, so this is a scene uh, with hot chocolate. And um, I have here, uh, let's see, um, in the side notes on themes that are going to be built up throughout the text. And I'll explain that in a second. Uh, so in a pocket of his knapsack, he'd found a last half packet of cocoa and he fixed it for the boy and then poured his own cup with hot water and sat blowing at the rim. You promised not to do that, the boy said. What? You know what, Papa? He poured the hot black, uh, sorry, the hot water back into the pan and took the boy's cup and poured some of the cocoa into his own and then handed it back. I have to watch you all the time, the boy said. I know. If you break little promises, you'll break big ones. That's what you said. I know, but I won't. They slogged all day down the south-facing slope of the watershed. Now, uh, what I'm highlighting here is something uh, called, uh, well, the theme thematically is the idea of uh, telling the truth and trust. Uh, the boy's trust in the man is much more significant than maybe, um, you know, a, a normal child in our world's trust in his parents, because uh, this means he has to trust his father to make all the right decisions uh, to keep him alive. Um, but this other, these fancy words, moral relativism versus moral absolutism, it's something we're going to go into. Basically, what it means is, is it moral, uh, something, a moral um, idea might be something that's right or wrong. So if it's wrong to lie or to deceive, um, you might say, so what the man has done here is tried to trick the kid and give him all the chocolate. He has lied for the sake of the boy to give him more. All right. So what the man has done here is said that um, what he's done is um, decided that lying is relative to a situation. So it depends on the situation. What the boy is arguing is moral absolutism, which is saying that right and wrong don't change based on circumstances. So even though the father, this is a minor lie, right? It doesn't mean anything. And the reason the father is doing it is to um, help the boy. But the boy is saying, basically, um, a promise is a promise because he promised not to do that in the past. Um, and what and deceit is deceit, no matter the reason for it. Um, or the situation. So even though the father deceives the boy to give him more, um, he the boy is uh, upset because he says, if you break little promises, you'll break big ones. That's what you said. He's doing something that um, children do all the time. They throw back at their parents. The parents try to instill the best of themselves, their best uh, ideals about right and wrong. Um, and, then the, and then when the parents fall short of that, uh, oftentimes the kid will point that out. All right. Um, in this case, it is not um, to the kid's benefit, but he is an absolutist. All right. So we're going to look at that as a theme running through the whole text. That's one of the basic differences between the man and the boy. Uh, the boy believes right and wrong don't change based on circumstances. The man believes that um, circumstances matter uh, to defining right and wrong. All right. There's a sharp crack from somewhere on the mountain, then another, just a tree falling. He said, it's okay. The boy was looking... Um, at the dead roadside trees. It's okay, the man said. All the trees in the world are going to fall sooner or later, but not on us. How do you know? I just know. Again, this is that where the boy has to trust that the father somehow knows something. It's a matter of faith, which is another um, uh, sort of theme here. Still, they came to the trees uh, across the road where they were forced to unload the cart and carry everything over the trunks and then repack it all on the far side. The boy found toys he'd forgotten he'd had. He kept out a yellow truck, and they went on with it sitting on top on top of the tarp. Um, these little things where the boy has a toy, um, later on we're going to talk about um, you know, swimming at the waterfall, um, the thing where, he, where the father makes a uh, sort of train out of the cart and lets the boy ride it. Um, these are things where uh, they're not necessary to survival in any basic biological sense, uh, or you know, food, shelter, um, clothing, and that sort of stuff. Um, but they are things that humans need. Um, and I was saying with the, on the opposite side of this, toys, um, music, artwork, none of these serve a purpose uh, in keeping us alive, but they are something that humans need. They're things that animals don't need. Uh, and 
on the flip side of that or on the far end of that spectrum is the thing we were talking about i was talking about with the um sort of drums and stuff at the end at the in the early days the idea that um people made new rituals and new um, cults uh, instead of religions or societies that there is always some need for some sort of symbolic interaction with the world uh, he woke whimpering in the night and the man held him Shh, he said Shh, it's okay i had a bad dream i know should i tell you what it was if you want to i had this penguin that you wound up and it would waddle and flap its flippers and we were in that house that we used to live in and and it came around the corner but nobody had wound it up and it was really scary okay it was a lot scarier in the dream i know dreams can be really scary why did i have that scary dream i don't know but it's okay now i'm going to put some wood on the fire you go to sleep the boy didn't answer then he said the winder wasn't turning so um the man has uh, like i said in like one of your questions is what is the man's philosophy of dreams um and it should be sort of implied already he said it before that uh, the dreams of someone in danger or peril should be uh dreams of peril uh now the boy's having them and the man is trying to uh uh you know console him and tell him it's no big deal um and this theme of dreams in the relationship to our waking life now i just mentioned the thing about toys uh and then the boy happens to dream about a toy doing a creepy uh creepy thing behaving as if it's uh, possessed or alive all right, we get to the waterfall and um, it's freezing, it's cold. There's no uh, use in going in. But again, like I said, uh, the man wants the boy to have some experiences. The idea is that, like I said, survival, basic survival is not enough. Um, and so thematically, um, you know, the theme are things we need beyond basic survival. Uh, the boy was so thin, you know, these are moments also where the man recognizes how much they're starving and how bad things are uh, going for them. Um, but the boy plays in the water. Um, they dress and climb up uh, the trail to the upper river. And um, and then they're going along. They find some mushrooms. They have these little moments of luck. Again, the man has to explain the entire world to him. What's a morel? <clears throat> they're a kind of mushroom. He has to show the boy what they can eat. Um, so again, that boy, the boy needs total trust and faith in his father's decision-making and knowledge. Uh, he walked out in the morning. The boy was right that this was a good place. He wanted to check for any sign of other visitors. This is a another theme that will continue to develop. The idea that the father is um, uh, very cautious. Uh, pessimistic is the opposite of optimistic. And the boy is a little bit optimistic. Uh, we can't stay, he said. It's getting colder every day and the waterfall is an attraction. It was for us and it will be for others. And we don't know who they will be. And we can hear them coming. It's not safe. We could stay one more day. It's not safe. Well, maybe we could find some other place on the river. We have to keep moving. We have to keep heading south. Doesn't the river go south? No, it doesn't. Can I see it on the map? Yes, let me get it. Uh, so the boy's a little more optimistic here. He wants to stay. It seems like a good place. The man agrees it's a good place, uh, but it's an attraction. Other people might come. And built into that is the assumption that other people are a danger, not that they're going to sort of build a group um, which humans kind of need. We, we don't survive well singularly. Um, so uh, this is just them kind of, again, the boy, uh, the theme of the lost world, which had structure, organization, boundaries. We had states, we had roads, we had maps to measure and contain and organize the, uh, the messiness of the world. Uh, and again, the man has to explain to the child. They come to a bridge. There's a truck that had been there. Um, there there's an element of their need to explore it. it also, it's blocking them. Um, there's a doghouse sleeper. That's just what um, truck drivers can, they can sleep in the little back of their truck. The uh, man and the boy sleep there that night uh, in the morning rain. The, sorry, had stopped and they unloaded the cart and passed everything under the truck to the other side and reloaded it. Uh, so we can see their difficulty. How long does it take to unload, slide it, move it? They've done that multiple times now. And they start thinking about, um, now there's these little signs of people having been there. Down the bridge, 100 feet or so, were blackened remains of tires that had been burned there. Uh, people setting tires on fire to keep warm or to cook. Um, you can probably get in from the roof. Somebody could have cut a hole in, uh, in the side of it by now. So the man climbs up um, to, the, to the roof of the truck because they need to investigate. They can't overlook any opportunity. It's like what we saw at the gas station. Uh, the boy looked worried. The boy is always worried um, and scared about these things. This is where there's sort of the flip-flop of who's optimistic and who's cautious. The man takes some chances sometimes. 
that the boy doesn't want him to take. He was scared of houses of the house. Now he's scared of the truck. Um, he gets a grip. There was a skylight about a third of the way um, down the roof. And he made his way to it. He had a magazine in his hip pocket. He took it out and tore some pages from it and wadded them up and got out his lighter and lit papers and dropped them into the darkness, a faint whooshing. He wafted away the smoke and looked down into the trailer. The small fire burning in the floor seemed a long way down. He shielded the glare of it with his hand, and when he did, he could see almost to the rear of the box, human bodies, sprawled in every direction, dried and shrunken in their rotted clothes. The small water burning paper drew down a wisp of flame and then died out, leaving a faint pattern for just a moment in the incandescence like the shape of a flower, a molten rose. Then all was dark again. Um, so again, there's this sort of uh, history of this recent world where <coughs> somebody has packed up humans into the back of a truck. Um, they've died. Um, they don't seem to, have, well, we don't know the condition of the bodies, except they're sprawled in every shape. Uh, attitude is every shape. So somebody had been driving this truck, um, carrying a load of human beings. The truck is jackknifed, which means um it's it's kind of crashed into the rail and is bent halfway like a jackknife like a knife that if that's halfway closed um so something had stopped the truck uh, and we don't know the history but it's pretty grisly so the, this seems to support the man's idea that people are dangerous and they should stay away from them um they wake up uh he sees a um a smoky light out there in the valley he rose and walked out to the ridge a haze of fire stretched for miles he squatted and watched it. He could smell the smoke. He wet his finger and held it to the wind. When he rose and turned back to the, uh, the tarp was lit from within by the boy, where the boy had wakened. Sighted there in the darkness, the frail blue shape of it looked uh, like the pitch of some last venture at the edge of the world. Something all but unaccountable. And so it was. This is just the sort of poetry that, re that indicates how the man realizes how alone they are in this world. Uh, the haze of fire is that the woods are constantly burning. The trees are falling down. Um, just because of their, they're so dead um, that their roots don't hold them up, and other trees are um, burning because lightning strikes them and nothing stops the uh, forest fires. Okay, they backtracked and camped in the actual road. Someone had come out of the woods in the night and continued down the melted roadway. Who is it? The boy said. I don't know. Who is anybody? They came upon him shuffling along the road before them, dragging one leg slightly and stopped from time to time to stand stooped and uncertain before getting out. What should we do, Papa? We're all right. Let's just follow and watch. Take a look, the boy said. Yes, take a look. So this is a guy who has been um, struck by lightning. He was as blunt, burnt looking as the country, his clothing scorched in black. One of his eyes was burnt shut, and his hair was but a nitty wig of ash upon his blackened skull. As they passed, he looked down, as if he'd done something wrong. His shoes were bound up with wire and coat, with road tar, he sat there in silence. He's been struck by lightning. Can't we help him, Papa? No, we can't help him. The boy kept pulling out his pop coat. Papa, he said. Stop it. Can't we help him, Papa? No, we can't help him. There's nothing for to be done for him. They went on. The boy was crying. He kept looking back. When they got to the bottom of the hill, the man stopped and looked at him and looked back up the road. The burned man had fallen over, and at that distance, you couldn't even tell what it was. I'm sorry, he said but we have nothing to give him. We have no way to help him. I'm sorry for what happened to him, but we can't fix it. You know what? You know that, don't you? Um, so here again is this theme of moral relativism. The boy, do you always help someone in need? He tells his son that they're, the good, that they're good people and that good people help others. But giving whatever they have to a man who's going to die seems like a, a bad move in terms of survival. I'm running out of time, but uh, here's where the man lays down the picture of his wife and decides to leave the photo and all that's left um, uh, of her behind. And here's where the boy, the next day, he still needs an explanation. The boy has been upset that they could not help. All right, and the man says, there's nothing we could have done. We can't share what we have or we'll die too. All right, um, there is a flashback to, those, to the early days and then there is um, a section that I'm having you skip, which is page 18. I'm going to upload this version. Uh, the reason is sort of a trigger warning. It is not necessary to the story. It's a flashback um, to the wife, and it's got uh, themes that we don't need to deal with. So I've crossed this out, and then we'll pick back up here, and I will assign what you're going to read.